I'm Andre Perry. I'm a David M. Rubenstein Fellow for the Metropolitan Policy Program, and I want to thank you all for coming on behalf of the entire Metro program. Um, it's my honor to introduce this important topic, um, and I wanted to lay out some context for you in, in, in explaining how we got here. Um, my area um, or program um, focus is on majority black cities. There are 1,200, approximately 1,200 census designated places that are 50% or more African American. And in each of those places, there are entrepreneurs, there are real estate assets, there's infrastructure, there's skill, yet these cities are treated like black people. When you think of Baltimore, Detroit, Memphis, what do you think of? You think of deficit. You think of problems. But you will, as you will learn, in many cities, there are, there's talent, skill, and ability. Part of my job in, at Metro, and this is what we do at think tanks in general, we make the case for cities. We lay out the institutions, the people who, if coordinated, can make things happen. We see this in Pittsburgh, we, we see it in Indianapolis, we see it in San Diego. Our efforts to make the case for a city can bring it to national prominence. Unfortunately, we also produce a lot of information about disparities. And when you do that, it helps reinforce the narrative that black folk are problems. And no one invests in deficits and problems. You invest in generally in white folks to fix those problems. My, again, my job is to lay out a new context. This is not about wearing rose-colored glasses. This is about identifying and developing talent that is there. And that's going to be my work moving forward. There are, in the 1,200 places, there are 50 that have a HBCU. Um, and it's amazing, HBCUs of all the graduates produce about a third, or of all the gra uh, black students, about a third major in business and or STEM fields. A third are basic of our students are doing what we tell them to do to make money. But the, the gaps persist. Um, in, a, uh, in addition, they produce the overwhelming lion's share of, of STEM graduates in particular. And so there are assets that we need to build upon in HBCUs. That's why we're here. I met Rodney. Um, who, by the way, I, I, it's my honor to now introduce him as a senior non-resident fellow of the Brookings Institution in the Metropolitan Policy Program. Give that man a hand. <laughs> yeah. And I met him at the Bayou Classic in New Orleans. Um, we're having a good time and amidst the football game, there was a pitch competition because he had the foresight to say, while folks are playing football, there's an audience to see another kind of game being played. And so Rodney is an asset. We would have lost mightily if we didn't bring him to Brookings. There are many other assets out there in this audience, in Detroit, in Memphis, in Indianapolis, in Pittsburgh, that are ignored. So I just want to introduce Rodney so he can also provide some context for today. Thank you. Wow. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> How's everyone doing? 
All right, I grew up in a Pentecostal apostolic church, so you got to talk back to me a little bit better than that. How is everyone doing? All right, very good. Welcome to Brookings. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, Andrew, thank you for your introductory remarks. Um, I wanted to be intentional about helping set the stage for the, the conversation we'll be about to have. And I think just looking at the historical context of how Brookings has contributed from a bipartisan perspective to the development of policy that impacts our nation, I think is incredibly important. Policy is the precedence for everything, and policy formation is also that precedence. Research, as well, provides the, the thesis for why policy should become a reality. And so you've led in that area. And I think the new opportunity is this intersectionality of policy formation, research, policy formation, and practicum. Mm -hmm. And as we do the work, studying the work and studying the, the outcomes of the work so we can tweak. You know, in the startup world, we call that product market fit, right? We keep tweaking, we keep tweaking, we keep tweaking until we get the product to a point where the market is like, I want it, I want it, I want it. And I think that that intersection is exciting. So I'm, I'm excited to be here. Um, another overarching precedent, uh, and I'm sure most of us read uh, the Duke University study about what we have gotten wrong about addressing the racial wealth gap. And the 10 myths that are put forth there um, are incredibly humbling, but a reality that we, we know too well. And so I encourage you to, you know, to read that. And so in response to you know, a prediction that the average net worth of a black family will be zero by 2053, those are pre that's pretty daunting. And when you read that study, it says, at the end of the day, as an aggregate, education won't change that number. Um, personal responsibility won't change it. Uh, it even says entrepreneurship mm -hmm. won't change it at the, at the aggregate um, level. Um, quote unquote, solid families won't change it. You know, there's a narrative around that as, as well. But what's been promising is that through the innovation economy, we have seen men and women, young men and women, and men and women of all ages create multi-generational wealth with no reliance on pre-existing multi-generational wealth. So the last 20 years, we've seen black, women, black men and women run to tech. And then we ran into another wall. We ran into um, another, another, another barrier. And so it's pretty lonely being the outlier. Like when you hear these stories about a founder who raises a seed round of a million dollars, but then there's no follow-up when they run out of money because they couldn't raise a Series A or they couldn't get you know, customers. We've been talking a lot about the outliers when that coder gets a top job at a tech company but then because of the hostile environment at that respective company, they're not promoted because they don't get the sponsorship, the mentorship, or the coaching that is typically and generously offered you know, to our white and Asian colleagues in general in the technology ecosystem. And so it's important, and this is why this dialogue and this conversation is important, is because even when we go back to Carter G. Woodson's Miseducation of the Negro and the, the thesis he was making around the importance of entrepreneurialism and productizing our pain coming out of slavery, coming uh, through Jim Crow uh, after deconstruction, and how it was important that our entrepreneurs were entrepreneurs because then they were also the job creators, respectively. And so the opportunity I see is we have these institutions whether in this case today it is our minority serving institutions, predominantly HBCUs, but not exclusively HBCUs. There's also the black church, there's also our associations, there's also the certifying organizations, right? All of these institutions that have been built um, since slavery, since deconstruction, since Jim Crow, et cetera, where we've won many battles and now we have a new economy that our outliers alone will not be able to solve. 
and we desperately require the intentional immersive investment of our institutions if we're actually going to have an accelerated opportunity to experience opportunity in itself in the new economy, the new economy of work, this new skills-based economy, uh, this uh, forthcoming um, gig economy. There's so much disruption and transformation that's happening at such an exponential path where we don't even know what the jobs of the future will look like because candidly the robots and the AI haven't told us yet. And so with that, <laughs> and because technology is one of the most major contributors also to income inequality and segregation, it's incredibly important that our institutions really turn up the juice, mm -hmm. right? And start investing resources in ensuring that black people and Hispanics and Latinx and all socially disadvantaged communities are represented, included equitably at every construct of the innovation economy. Well, you got the context. Um, I'm going to encourage you to tweet um, this information out. You see the hashtag tech while black. Um, I want to thank my, my colleague Martha uh, for uh, pulling that together for us. Yeah, that's but, pretty dope. Yes, yeah, dope. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, again, this is a tech um, a panel, so utilize social media. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.